to make sure that I give room for any engine three from the ICU or second to engine. If you could just go to the right shoulder, minor patient, head pain. You can at this point just let us know if you want to continue. made me decide to become a stringer. So I've been a photographer for over 20 years. I started off in the extreme sports industry. I've always loved documenting action, fast moving, fast moving, heart racing, exciting action. That's what I've always enjoyed more than anything else as far with, with a camera in my hand. It, you know, Zach was, kept asking me to ch come check it out and see what I thought of it. And, and I was, uh, I was filming nightlife at the time and I was, I was having a blast. And, uh, I went out and we went on a, and I went on a ride along with him and I started to realize what, what he does and what on scene TV was about and what they're trying to accomplish. They're using imagery to tell the stories of what's really going on in the, in the areas that, that, that they're covering. I decided to become a stringer because I fell in love with, you know, the, the pace, the, the fact that it's very heavy action. You know, I mean, we're, we're, we're out, we're out telling the story of what's going on in the world. You know, whether it's crashes or fires or shootings or stabbings or it's just as much shooting action as, as any extreme sport that I've documented. with my parents driving me to scenes. Um, I was a, a still photographer for the North County Times, which is now out of business. Um, I, I would list, I got a scanner in fifth grade and that was, those were the scanners that I started on. Started shooting stills for North County Times and eventually I met Paul at a scene and he was like, why are you shooting stills? You could make so much more money making video or shooting video. And so I, he, he literally gave me a video camera and said, here, use this, see if it makes you money and here's some resources. And I used that to slowly build up into this obsession. I got into photography because I wanted to tell stories. 
you know? I wanted to be... I wanted to be behind the camera when things were happening. And it's never just like crazy things. I wanted to be there when when people are building things with their hands, you know, like I want to cover artists, I want to do all these things. But what really got me out there is I wanted to be a war photographer. You know, I wanted to, to join the military, do my, my stint in combat, and I wanted to go switch over to be a combat photographer. That never happened, um, which got me to take up the wedding photography. And once I got good enough at that, I took up product photography, which led me to a gun show uh, in Vegas, world's largest gun show. So one night, I was at a bar, just hanging out with some friends, meeting some new people, networking, and I run into Zach Coleman. I spoke over a beer and he spoke over whatever he was drinking. He doesn't drink much, kind of a lightweight. And uh, he told me, you know, he gave me his card. He's like, you know, you're a photographer, I'm a photographer. If you want to ride along, come along with me and I'll show you, I'll show you around. And if you're interested, you got the job. Uh, for me, like, I really love storytelling um, and photography, photojournalism, you know, stringing that to me is how I told a story. Um, I don't necessarily like to write, uh, so I wanted to capture what was going on and to tell a story that way. Um, and for me, I like informing people of what's going on around them, uh, educate them, and you know, the stories we put out every night is doing that. You know, it's letting people know what's happening around them, you know, things to look for, stuff like that. So for me, it just really came down to wanting to tell stories and not having to write a story, letting the story unfold in front of me and telling what happened. I was interning at the register, uh, about to start freelancing for him, and I was coming home one night and I heard over the scanner, uh, there was like a SWAT situation, I believe in orange going on, and I usually wasn't out during the night, so I, I never ran into Brent, so I get down the scene and all of a sudden I see this guy, he's got all his gear on, big old camera, and I'm like, what is this? Like during the day, you know, it's just the news channel. So I'm like, what's this guy doing? So he's filming. I started talking to him a little bit and I'm like, Oh, you know, what's going on? And like, I really, I think the first thing he said to me was like, are you my competition? Are you shooting video? And I'm like, no, 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 man. Like I just have stills. Like I have no idea what's going on. So we kind of laughed about it. And on that night we hung out for, I don't know, I think we were on scene for like an hour just kind of jibber jabbing. He used to do stuff for the register back in the day. So we had that connection and we just kind of hit it off. You know, I was doing stills, he was doing video. And uh, so I got his number that night and then um, I started riding along with him. Uh, I would sit in his car. He would kind of show me how they did their things with video and listening to radios and stuff like that. So, you know, I was in the beginning of it. I had a good idea, but Brent definitely brought me over and then brought me on on scene and, you know, really showed me how things work out here at night. Um, you know, we've become really good friends from it. Uh, I go, you know, he comes to family gatherings. We go to birthdays together. Um, you know, who would ever thought going to a random SWAT call at, you know, at two in the morning or whatever would have brought on a really great relationship. And, uh, you know, I'm very thankful for it. I wouldn't be probably doing this right now if I didn't meet him and we connected that way. So that was kind of a good way to come about getting into this industry for sure. So pretty much, um, I became kind of a stringer, or a freelance videographer. I, I was a reserve um, years ago, probably about 18, 19 years ago um, in the city of Linwood. And I started taking a camera, uh, still camera with me. And I was taking photos of the guys and I would be on scene. If I wasn't doing firefighting stuff, um, the off days I would come down them and I would kind of shoot still photography. Um, kind of the guys would buy my, my, my camera, you know, or my photos. And, um, then I came into Orange County and I was like, nobody was really out in the middle of the night doing still photography. And I started doing that and I kind of hooked up with Orange County register. Um, I was making some decent money. I was living at home and, um, uh, the money started doing really well as free doing freelance work. And I made a name for myself and with the, you know, the photography end of it. And then I had a 
good friend of mine because I belonged to a radio group, and he kind of approached me back in 1996, 97, actually late 97, and said, "Hey, why don't you come and shoot video? Um, there's a g- good amount of money, and I, you know, I, I know your, I, I've heard of your name in in Orange County. Why don't you come and do it?" So he gave me the equipment. I didn't have a news camera at the time, big shoulder camera, kind of weighed a ton, and um, I was selling news to the news stations. It was awesome. I would come home in the morning and uh, see my stuff air on the news, which is a phenomenal feeling. It's just, uh, it's still to this day, it's a phenomenal feeling. And, um, you know, I was young, I was in my early 20s, and I was making some good cash. And uh, I love it. Um, I've been sticking with it. I've been doing it almost 25 years. I'm 43 now. And um, I guess the day that it, the adrenaline isn't going anymore, I guess I'll throw in the towel. But until then... <laughs> I'm going to keep going. It's, um, it's awesome. I love it. It's a, uh, it's a great job because every night you never know what's going to happen. And, um, it's, uh, it's cool. It's a great job. I hadn't originally set out to be a stringer. Actually, I wanted to be a news reporter, like doing uh, live shots in front of a camera, that sort of thing. And then a news anchor. So what I would originally do was that I would I would borrow a, a camera from the college that I was going to from the uh, television department because I was in the broadcast program and I would take the camera home with me on the weekends and I would do uh, little stand-up reports. I knew people were out there shooting the news at night, but I didn't know exactly what a stringer was. Um, I got the brilliant idea one night of, hey, why don't I shoot things that are happening around town with this camera because they'll look nice and maybe I can report on them. So now I was getting all the law enforcement calls. And then it went from just doing news reports in front of the camera to just shooting video of the incidents. Um, I got in contact with the right people. I started sending my video out. I actually started legitimately feeding to the television stations. It, it might have not been, you know, within 10 minutes of shooting a story, but I still got my video out. And I, I used to get hits um, back in the day. So I, I see this dark colored Crown Vic in the carpool lane. It passes me. And I see the license plates. It has the antennas. I'm like, oh, it's a stringer. But... Hey, this pursuit's out of Simi Valley. I'm not going to let some stringer from the valley take my pursuit. So I make sure that he doesn't pass me. I flash my ambers that I had on my uh, my Volkswagen at the time at him. So lo and behold, the person in this dark crown Vic, who I thought was someone else, ended up being Zach. And uh, we talked briefly. He liked the fact that I blew his doors off on a pursuit in my, uh, my black Volkswagen Passat with the intent on the trunk and just ambers. And about a week and a half later... I was in my very own Crown Vic, fully loaded, working as a high caliber stringer. Sorry, I guess we're walking.
baby acting normal? He's acting normal? Okay. He's going to be uh, behind you, okay? In his car seat. So. in the photography uh, hobby and uh, so I, I met a few friends through the hobby and uh, they go out they shoot these houses on fire at night and you know it's something interesting something out of the ordinary I myself I've always been kind of intrigued with knowing what's going on around my uh, community uh, I mean I had a little scanner growing up as a teenager um, 13 years old I admire it whenever I see the helicopter outside my house, wonder what's going on. Um, and, and, you know, I've always been intrigued with, like, law enforcement stuff as ever since I've grown up. So, with those two combined, um, I rode out with these guys one day. Um, and, you know, I, the first night that I rode out, I saw this car cut in half. And the car basically was racing, lost control, plowed into a palm tree, and all four people in the car were killed. And that was just something wild. I mean, it didn't really phase me that much. It was more intriguing seeing, you know, the damage, the, uh, the, the amount of catastrophe that can happen from something so small. And 
it, as much as it sounds like it's horrible, like it, it's just something that happens in everyday life and something that most people don't really see. So when I saw that, I was like, interesting. Uh, this is something I could report on. This is something I could do. Um, and little did I know if this was a job. I thought it was simply just a hobby, sharing pictures and getting it published simply for the viewing of others. Um, little did I know that I could be doing streaming as, a, as an actual job. Telling everyone what's going on around me and seeing my work across a bunch of platforms on the news channels is what really got me into this. You know, that we had, you know, Walter Cronkite and Barbara Walters and, you know, who were real journalists, you know, they went out and got the stories and worked for them and told the truth. And, you know, it wasn't just about creating hysteria. And you, the second you heard something, you throw it out there and hope that it's right, you know, and then say, and then alter it like the next broadcast or whatever. It was real journalism, and it's like that's been it's so lost. And I thought if I could do that, if I could tell a story, but I can't. Like once you sell it, it's like not mine to tell anymore. It can be altered, or I don't, I don't know. So it's this huge conflict of contributing to that bullshit of of a different type of media. The ability to convey a scene and uh, be like as artistic as I can with the scene. You know, I can go and get low angles of these squad cars. I can go and show the emotions of people at a crash scene and how they're reacting to it. The family that was there, and you know, they, maybe they lost a loved one. I'm out there telling the story of what happened, and that's something that. If I'm not there for her, no one's ever gonna realize like what truly happened that night. It's something that I can put out to the world, say, hey, this happened. And it's something that I really enjoy is seeing my work out there and, you know, it making money in the process, but that's really not what matters. The the fact is I'm out there telling the story, making friends with uh, law enforcement and uh, you know, showing what firefighters do every day, you know, that's just what I enjoy about streaming. I don't know why I stay. <laughs> it's maybe pride. Uh, again, I like being the only female. It's probably a little bit of ego. Um, the ability to get to places where other people can't. And I don't want to lose that ability. You know, I like having that. That right, you know, to do that. It's not really panning out as a good career. <laughs> you know, it's exciting and fun, but it's like, now I'm spoiled because it's like, yeah, again, how do you go from this, like chasing adrenaline and being right in it to the mundane? And I don't do well with the mundane. Like, I've never done well. I mean, sitting here all night is boring as fuck for me. Like, that's a punishment. How do I pass the time on slow nights? Well, and the girlfriend goes to sleep and it gets slow. Um, YouTube is your best friend and sometimes Netflix as well. <laughs> but I love how they're literally like smashing windows. I love when they shoot out the window with the beam background. Look at that. That's pretty cool. Is that a tear gas? The amount of drama, the amount of intensity that we see condensed, I mean, I guess the only way to describe it is, is that I would liken what we see on a, on a daily basis. <clears throat> What we see in a day, most officers may see in a week or a month. You know, because we're going to every call in every area. Okay, fine. Maybe we are a little bit removed from the first responders that are treating everybody. But it doesn't change the fact that we're there and we see all of this and we're documenting. So, with this job, I mean... You know, we've all seen a lot of horrible things. There's things that will stay with us for the rest of our lives. 
there's things I wish no one would ever have to see that we've seen. Um, you know, it comes with the territory, but I remember one night, uh, there was a call for a motorcyclist down on the freeway. And as we're going, driving to it, they start hearing updates of, oh, you know, she's down in lanes, been hit by multiple cars. And so we know it's going to be bad. And we get on scene and we get out and like CHP is like, hey, be careful where you walk, which is never a good sign. And, you know, we're walking around. I put my light, you know, there's a piece here, a piece there. You know, it, it's really, it's scattered everywhere. And you look at the body and I mean, she was basically ripped in half. Like, oh, 11, 931 on red in pursuit. Got a pursuit. On red, go ahead. Sorry about that. You know, like something like that, I, I will never forget what that looks like. Like, I just won't. I never thought I would ever see a body in half, and I did, you know, and it was just, it was gross. You know, there's stuff everywhere, and then the corner's picking up pieces, you know, and you're watching them pick up, you know, what you, looks like a string almost, and then there's a foot attached to it, you know, and it's just like. I don't know how the corners do it because I was sitting back there just like, oh man, I wish I would never have had to see this. And we do, you know, I, there's times where I'm like watching a movie or something and I'm like, yeah, that's what it looks like. The people that do the effects for Hollywood, they really know their stuff because it really looks real. Like I've seen most of it and it, it's uh, pretty scary. So, you know, I get a lot of people ask me what stories kind of stand out there's a lot i mean you put 20 plus years there's a lot of action that i've been on and there's a lot of stuff that you know you really think about it and you're like the wow wow how did this happen and there's a lot of you know stories out there that they kind of stick out like years ago i was on the five freeway in valley view in santa fe springs and I got on scene before the fire department and CHP. It was a big rig uh, cab burning. And the guy was hanging out the window, uh, burning to death, screaming. There was nothing I could do. Um, I just felt so bad for the guy. Because, um, you know, sometimes, you know, we get on scene before everybody else. There was literally nothing I could do. And I wasn't going to film that guy hanging out screaming. So one night, uh, it, was, it was a call in Downey. Essentially, the call was that someone was hanging from a tree. And Danny Fire was, was en route. So I show up and I stay pretty far away because I wasn't sure what was happening. Um, it just so happened that... It just so happened that the... I guess it was a kid. I don't know how old he was. I believe it was a high school student. He had hung himself. And so I was there for when they, um, when they were doing compressions on him. And when they finally put the cloth over him, when they declared him dead, essentially, one of the craziest and probably one of the most unforgettable things I had ever seen as far as the stringer world goes, is the, or my stringing experience goes, is the mother of this child just shrieking uncontrollably and it sounded as if I was standing right next to her I was far away I had my longest lens on my camera and I didn't want to disrupt the scene in any way I didn't want anybody to know I was there I stood behind my, my, my trunk the entire time didn't use any lights I was I was as light as can be and I was as quiet as can be it was insane she never stopped screaming. I shut the windows to my car once I got in. Once I realized what it was, jumped in the car. And basically, I could still hear her while I was in the car. It was so loud. So loud, so uncontrollable. I don't know if I could ever find that footage again. I don't know if I'd ever want to watch that footage again. I don't think I'll ever forget that night. And again, we don't, we don't run suicides. The closest thing we ever run to suicides are suicide by cop. And those are usually adults. You know, and the parents are almost never there. And nobody ever reacts the way that that lady did. So, 
So uh, another story that kind of stands out. Um, just recently, I was on. Um, I was kind of on. A, I was on a family of four in a van that had fallen asleep, and um, apparently the tailpipe was bent. They were backed into a stall, and uh, the tailpipe was bent, kind of the direction into the vehicle, and they died of carbon monoxide poisoning. And um, it was a cold night, or, or you know, cold night in the middle of the night. They probably left their vehicle on. And uh, just horrible. Um, little children were in their onesies, and you know they had been dead, I guess, for between three to five days. The uh, coroner said, and um, I mean, it's just horrible. I don't know if any night stands out to me the most because most of my nights are exactly the same up until that, up until the point that I get a call. Then they kind of branch off into their own thing. But once I, once I, I clear a call, then. Um, it all goes back to being the same as it was the night before. If you try to process what you see on a daily basis of, you know, oh, there's a guy dead in the street or that person's house burned down and the family's crying across the street. If you try to make sense of what that what that is, then it'll it'll just mess you up. But if if you just see it and you don't really think about it and you just, you know, you do your job, you edit your video and you see those things and you um you go and you you call up a coworker and you uh, you crack a few jokes. Not about the incident, but you know, just crack a few jokes. Everything's okay. It doesn't really. Um, I haven't really seen anything where I go and reflect like, wow, that was uh, that was messed up. It just just keep moving. You can't you can't dwell on something or it'll mess you up for sure. So uh, one of the other stories that kind of stands out, um, kind of fresh in my mind right now. Um, when I was out and I had started working the, during the day, when I first got my news camera, I was out during the day, one of the day side stories. Um, it was early in the morning. Um, it's kind of like in, early winter time and it was very cold dew. Um, you know, it was real, real cold out. And uh, this was out off of Silverado Canyon and, uh, came out as a head on collision. And it was a uh, lady that was, um, uh, driving it's a two-lane highway um kind of in the in the backwoods area of orange county and there was a uh, son and a father they were headed to a do a job they were painters and um they were minding their own business and this woman she was uh doing her makeup and she was looking in her rear view mirror and she veered off into the other lane and went head on at a high rate of speed um she was killed instantly um, and I'll never forget it in my head. I get there and the first arriving truck company is using the jaws of life to cut her out. Um, the, um, son and the father, I believe they were injured pretty badly, but the woman, the car was crushed like an accordion. They had to use the jaws of life to cut her out. And when they pulled her out of the vehicle, she was still holding on to her makeup bag in her hand. I will never forget that. It was just one of the first real bad fatality stories that I covered. And it's one of those that you just kind of, you kind of really remember and it sticks out. And it wasn't the crash. It was just the bad thing of her doing her makeup, not paying attention, um, and could have killed those two other people, those innocent people, and having that bag in her hand. It's just one of those stories, you know, you just kind of like, you know, it's a horrible story, but it's like, oh, man, you know, I mean, couldn't you have waited and maybe pull off the road to do your makeup? But it's kind of like now um, it falls into people like doing texting while they drive and ver merge into other people's lanes. And, you know, a lot of people get killed doing that. But anyway, it's one of those stories where it really, uh, really sticks out. There's times where you, you feel really bad of the situation that's going on and what you're filming and witnessing and uh you know stories like that are they stick with me like i will always remember the female that got hit on the freeway uh you know the the boat that flipped over and the two guys that died because i was there in the morning when the divers found the bodies and pulled you know two bodies on onto their boat you know put them in the uh body bag and brought them to shore like there is i drive around orange county and i could tell you like i know what happened here what was here what was there like you know, Orange County will never be the same for me, no matter where I'm at in here, because most places I have a story to it. Um, 
I no longer see it as, you know, the place that I live in. I just look at it as the place that things happen. And I'm just kind of viewing everything from a third person perspective. If I'm not working, I still have the, the hunch that something's going to happen and I, I need to be there doing my job. I swear to God, if they use our labs. PCH in Malibu, and it ended with at least two people in the hospital and this van in the ocean. Take a look. Here's a close look at that van as firefighters went through it to make sure nobody was still inside. Around 11 o'clock last night, deputies got a lot of calls about a reckless driver just hitting several vehicles on PCH near Yerba Buena Road. By the time deputies got there, the driver had already crashed there into the ocean. Witnesses helped firefighters find the driver who was then loaded onto this stretcher. He broke his ankle, also suffered internal bleeding. Another woman who also went to the hospital apparently involved in one of the crashes. Now it is unclear why the driver was being so reckless here, but deputies are investigating whether alcohol was a factor. Okay, thank you, Brandy. And now to the federal grand jury looking into Russia's interference Man. into the election. There sure are a number of calls that I've been on that that it, that have stayed with me. You know, some of which I can joke about, like you know, Suge Knight putting his cigar in the in the, the side of the tree saying, I'll be back in a little bit for that. And now here we are two plus years later, almost three years later, and it's still in the tree. <laughs> fight about man can you say anything about the allegations against him
some story sugar, you know. He replied the thing. It's came out a little bit more since the the show um, Nightcrawler came out. A lot of people have asked me, "Hey, aren't, aren't you paparazzi?" Kind of, and no, I'm not. I shoot breaking news. I shoot crashes, fires, homicides. I don't sit like paparazzi. Paparazzi want to get the most negative, bad thing on a star, and they make a huge amount of money from the tabloids. And we don't do that. We don't sit outside Britney Spears' house or Gwen Stefani's home, um, seeing when she comes out of the out of the. Uh, her house and drives and we don't follow them or anything like that so we're nowhere really can't compare the paparazzi with us well we're not paparazzi we're a paparazzo we're um we're stringers um we do strictly news related incidents however if a celebrity is involved then it's if the celebrity is peppered into whatever the hell we're working then it's a bonus for us but we're not actively out um, following celebrities or we don't really care what celebrities are up to you know some people question our integrity or our our own morals and sometimes things happen in front of us and we can't stop it you know we're there to do our job some of the things that we see happen whether i'm standing there or not you know and a lot of people will see the actions of a stringer and be like why didn't you know this stringer do abc to prevent x y and z I'm only there to capture whatever is happening. I'm not there to get involved. If something bad happens while I'm there, it was meant to happen. If I try to stop that thing, bad thing from happening, I might be the bad thing that happens that ends up on TV. If it were you involved in a horrible accident, incident, whatever it may be, you would be better off to have me there filming the scene in a professional and courteous manner than five yahoos on their cell phones and you don't know what they're going to do with that footage. You know what I'm going to do with that footage. I'm going to shoot it. I'm going to cut it. I'm going to make it look good. And I'm going to put it on TV. If you see me while I'm at work, chances are it's one of the worst days of your life. You know, and I can handle it. You know, and I try and I, I try and show as much compassion as I possibly can while I'm doing my job. I try and give people as much privacy as I possibly can, and I try and find that balance between getting enough information to tell my job, tell the story, and do the job adequately, and and giving giving these people their respect and a little bit of privacy. And um, and you know that's 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 how I can keep doing the job. Is that you know I I know that I need all of this information. So I don't know if there's any really any long term mental effects or, you know, PTSD, uh, seeing a lot of the bad things that we see at night. But um, I haven't really I mean, I've been doing this almost 24 years now. And um, I don't know. I mean, even my wife has asked if, you know, any PTSD or anything like that. Do I suffer the stuff that, you know, bothers me? I just don't really let it bother me. Um, if I talk about it, it helps me. I think if I held everything in, um, the things that you see, the blood, the guts, the gore, and everything, um, I think for sure it would bother me a lot more. I think, I, you know, some of the past guys that we've had work with us, um, things have bothered them, especially with children. Um, nightmares, you know, and waking up in the middle of the night, um, not being able to sleep. But for myself, I don't know. I just... Uh, Things just really, they don't, I don't let it bother me. Um, I talk about things if it does with my wife or, you know, my dad or my brothers. Um, and I think that helps 100%. Um, you know, when there is problems and stuff like that, if I can't then it, deal with it. Mostly it's with children. Um, you know, it comes with the adults and stupid criminals and stuff like that have caused what they've done. I don't let that phase me at all. It's mostly the children. Is it different responding to a call when it involves children versus adults? 
Responding to the call? No. No. Filming the call? Yes. The way I document stories involving kids and the way I document stories involving adults are slightly different. Because I go out of my way to make sure that I don't show a child's face. The stations don't like to, to show children's faces. Uh, I, I will show children's faces if they're, if they're victims in a traffic collision, maybe. If there's no other way to tell the story, then I'll show it. But I, I, I try not to, I try not to show children's faces. You know, and calls involving children, tragic calls involving children, yeah, they get to everybody. You know, they, that's just the nature, that, that's just the nature of the calls. It's just, they're, you know, it's, they're sad. They pull at everybody's heartstrings. They're gut-wrenching sometimes. All, for all the same reasons why they're even more newsworthy. I get on scene. And I'm for, on the first street. Freeway's already blocked off. The freeway's already blocked off, and traffic is backed up. And I get there, and I see um, I see a guy. He's upside down inside his jeep. Um, but before that, let me backtrack a little bit. Before that, I see a girl crying. It's a little girl. The girl's okay. Everything else should be fine. It's just another expectation. I go on the other side and I see a, a person underneath the tarp. And I'm like, oh man, like, I didn't think it was fatal. And so I'm filming, I'm filming. And so, so far, as of right now, all I know is it's a double fatal. And so I get, I get the footage from that side, go back around to the other side, and I plop my tripod down, my camera down again. Maybe like another five minutes more of filming. They finally get the car up and they're able to start pulling the, the guy out. However, they don't pull the guy out. Instead, they pull out a car seat with a tarp in it. And I just about lost my mind. Uh, and the footage just hear me like, like, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit. Oh, shit. So I saw that, and it already hit me like right away. I was like, oh my gosh, this is terrible. And so this guy's entire family um, is just gone from this car accident. So it was his three-year-old daughter, and I want to say three-month-old baby, and the dad. I film a little bit more. I just get one more shot of the car seat as they're moving it around. And I bail. I don't even finish the call. Um, uh, I had like a mini breakdown. It was, uh, I don't think I've ever been so messed up by a call before as far as this job goes. Um, I mean, I've been to uh, calls where, where um, children have been hurt and, or have, have died because of violent reasons, but I've never seen the child or the body or anything like that. Especially just being like a new dad at that time, it just really, really messed with me. I'm not here to collect dead body photos. I am not here to see the most gruesome thing I've ever seen. I'm not really interested in all that. I'm here to do my job. And the next course of action is I'm here to tell the story as respectful as possible for the person that died. I'm not trying to show a dead body on TV. That's not what I do. Um, 
I'm just there to tell a story. Someone, someone at this scene died here tonight. Nobody, to be honest, for the most part, nobody really needs to know who that person is. And it drives me a little crazy whenever their name is released. So, is it... I just try not to be disrespectful. Bottom line, you know. That person has a family. Doing this job, I could easily just, uh, just as... I could easily end up in the same spot they're at. Be, the, be, be trapped in a vehicle. Be dead on the side of the road. Any of those things. I mean, any job that I do, I'm going to be out, of, out, out in the field. You know, any of those things can handle, can happen to me. The last thing I want is my family finding out on TV because someone put my face on there when they're not supposed to. That I died, you know, before they even found out from, like, the actual people who are supposed to tell them. So for me, you know, bring on the rags and cover that body, you know? You know, um, yeah, okay, fine. I got to bifurcate my life. I've got to, I got to leave the, I got to leave the, the horrors and the gore and the everything else that I see out in the, in the real world. I've got to leave all that stuff there. When I go home, I go home and that's, you know, I, that's got to be my, you know, my sanctuary. You know, but there's, I mean, this job is really hard. I could try and explain how hard this job is, but I would fail. You know, this TV show comes around and, and you've got, you, you've got a guy like Scott who's saying, well, like there's six things that you need. You need a car, you need your radios, you need this, you need that, you need a camera, you need a computer, you need a, you need your website or whatever. And he's like, then this other thing that I can't teach you, it's the hustle. You either have it or you don't. I disagree with him. I know countless people that, that have all of those things, that have the hustle, that weren't successful at this job. You know, this job... This job is one of the most difficult things I've ever experienced. And you never know, and I never know from day to day, from call to call, minute to minute, I never know if I'm everybody's friend or everybody's enemy until I get there. You know, but at the end of the day, I've broken stories that the TV stations wouldn't have been able to air if they didn't have my footage. I've, I had some friends that, uh, that lost a friend of theirs really tragically about, you know, it was, uh, next week will be four years. It was like the week of Christmas or the week before Christmas. And, uh, and he was walking home and, and he was, uh, run down by a car and he was killed. And his father and his grandfather were both famous judges. And nobody would have known about it if I wouldn't have been there because nobody else covered it. You know, I mean, it would have, people would have found out later, days later. But, you know, I'd like to think that telling the story and covering the story and, and getting the public's help may have helped identify and catch the person that was behind it because LAPD had no information to go off of when I was there. They had, they didn't even have a vehicle description. You know, so when people ask me, what, it, what is it about this job that keeps me coming out? It's that the public has a right to know everything that goes on around them. The public has a right to know about all the tragic things. They also have, they also should expect more positive things as well. But you know, it takes a person doing the job that I do to be able to get that timely information so that the public is well informed. Let's see if he looks as far that way. Oh look, it's just a few, just some engines.
<laughs> That's awesome. That just made my night. That just made my night. Look at that view and that train. Like, that's awesome. Like, come on. <laughs> Nathan, Gabriel, ever Jeremy, everybody would just be jealous of me right now. Like, I just, I just experienced that. Yeah. This is a pretty cool job. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Alex. <laughs> I just got so tickled by that. That was so cool. Okay. I'll stop. <laughs> Why is there someone laying down in the middle of the street? Don't lay in the middle of the street, man. Come on. Nice. <laughs> oh, man. He's like, God, is that you? 